I'm Kate Rayworth, and this is the story of what happens when business meets the donut. The donut is a vision of human prosperity in the 21st century. The aim is to leave no one falling short of the essentials of life in the hole in the middle, short on water, food, health, education, housing, and these are crowdsourced from the world's governments from the Sustainable Development Goals, which means that all the governments in the world have already agreed that every person in the world has a claim on meeting these essentials. So leave no one falling short, but at the same time, don't overshoot the ecological ceiling made up of the nine planetary boundaries, which are Earth's life supporting systems that keep this unique, delicately balanced planet, a home sweet home for humanity and all other species here with us. So the aim is to meet the needs of all people within the means of the living planet. But if that's the goal, we are very far from that balance right now. All the red in this image shows you the extent to which people are falling short on the essentials of life or humanity is in overshoot on planetary boundaries. Let me bring it home in some headlines. Climate change is hitting harder and sooner than forecast. Humanity has wiped out two thirds of the world's wildlife since 1970. There are microplastics in human bodies the world over. Children breathe toxic air. There's land degradation, water shortages, phosphorus pollution, ocean acidification to hit levels not seen in 14 million years. And the richest 1% of people own half of the world's wealth. In the words of the US writer William S. Burroughs, after taking one look at this planet, any visitor from out of space would say, I want to see the manager. Who would we take him to meet? If you need some reprieve, this is a great headline from NASA. The hole in Earth's ozone layer is finally closing up because humans did something about it. And that's the point. We can do something about all of this because it's all the result of human activity. So what if we were to take that visitor from outer space to meet businesses? And what happens when business meets the donut? How do companies respond to the challenge that the donut lays before us? Well, over the past eight years, I've had fascinating conversations with companies of all kinds from three-person social enterprise startups to Fortune 500 companies. And here are some of the companies that I've had that conversation with or that have told me that they have sat around the table and discussed the donut and their business within it. What's fascinating is the massive range of responses that comes from companies when they are confronted by the donut. And it's what I call the corporate to-do list. What's a business going to do once it sees the challenge ahead? Well, the first response is the oldest do nothing. You know, the state of humanity, it's a sorry affair, but as Milton Friedman said, the business of business is business and everything we're doing is nearly legal. So we'll just keep on until the costs of breaking the law exceed the profits. This is not going to get us anywhere close to where we need to be. And it has no place in the 21st century. So the first step up is to do what pays now. If we will save money by cutting carbon emissions in our supply chains, then we'll do that. If we will gain new customers by getting a niche certification, we will do that. Yes, this is beginning to go in the right direction, but it's far too in incremental, far too slow for the scale of change that's needed. So the next level up is companies that say we're going to do our fair share. And there's been a lot of this over the past decade. You know, our nation says we're going to cut national carbon emissions by 20% in 20 years. So we'll cut our carbon emissions by 20% in the next 20 years. The trouble with fair shareism, as anyone knows who's been out to a restaurant with friends and everyone says they're going to chip in with their fair share of the bill, is that it very rarely adds up and you don't want to be the one left holding the platter for the waiter. And the idea of doing your fair share all too quickly slips in the minds of some companies into what's my fair share to take? What's our share of the world's carbon budget? So we need to move rapidly past that. And the next level up is to do mission zero. Have zero carbon emissions in our supply chains. Have zero human rights abuses in our supply chains. Now this is transformative because business has never been done like this before. But as in the words of the regenerative designer, Bill McDonough, why settle for being 100% less bad when you can break through the ceiling of your imagination and do good, become net positive? 
And that is where we kick up to the top level. Companies that on seeing the donut say, it's as if this is our corporate logo. We exist, we are in business in order to help achieve these goals. That's why we're here. So what would it take for business to do the donut? If we're to tackle the deep degradation of the living world and the inequalities in human societies, then two dynamics need to be brought into play. We need to create businesses that are regenerative by design and distributive by design. And let me dive in and talk more about each of those. So this is the degenerative industrial system that we've inherited. We take Earth's materials, make them into stuff we want, use it for a while, often only once, and then throw it away. And that linear take, make, use, lose is what pushes us over planetary boundaries. This is what it looks like when we take again and again and again from Earth's sources. This is what it looks like when we throw our waste again and again and again into Earth's sinks, plastics into lakes and rivers, electronic waste into the neighbourhoods of the world's poorest people. And I sincerely believe that your grandchildren and mine will look back at these pictures in the archives and they will ask us, did you know about this? Did you really think that this was normal? Because they'll see what it is, that it's disgusting, the way we treat the living world and our fellow humans. They will see that we had to turn those linear degenerative arrows around to make a system that's regenerative, that's cyclical or circular by design. First, separating biological nutrients and allowing nature to do her thing and regenerate while capturing value at each stage of the decomposition of nature's materials. But then also the technical nutrients, all human-made materials, that we need to mimic nature's processes by restoring, repairing, reusing, refurbishing, and only ultimately recycling them. So that this is how we will come to work with and within the cycles of the living world. This is an economy that will run on renewable energy. The key principle is that waste from one process becomes food for the next, and therefore it will be an economy that's modular by design so something can be disassembled, taken apart, and just the piece that needs repairing can be repaired. It's an economy in which we will move from ownership of washing machines and cars and light bulbs to buying the services of laundry and mobility and lighting. Here's one example of a company that's putting itself on that journey. Back in the 1990s, Interface Carpets would admit they were a do-nothing company. And then the CEO, Ray Anderson, saw a presentation about cradle-to-cradle -cradle design and he said it was like an epiphany, it was like a stake through my heart and was determined to transform his company. So set out to do Mission Zero, to become 100% renewable energy based by 2020, to run on the principle that waste from one process is food for the next. And that's how they made over 90% drop in factory waste since 1996. But still, that's just mission zero. And now Interface have lifted their sights to the next level. So they are reintegrating materials that have been dispersed into the living world back into the system, buying disused and discarded fishing nets from fishermen in the Philippines and turning them back into carpets. Further still, this is an image of their factory in New South Wales, and they've started to ask what if our factories truly belonged in the ecosystems in which they're located? So what is nature's genius here in New South Wales? How does nature sequester carbon dioxide here? How much groundwater does she store? How does she purify the air? How much soil does she create? How much does she cool the climate from the treetops to the forest floor? And how much biodiversity is housed here? And what if our factories aim to be as generous as the forest, to sequester as much carbon, store as much groundwater, purify the air, create as much soil, cool the climate just as the forest does and house as much biodiversity? So this is one example of a company that's on that journey to being regenerative by design. What about distributive by design? Well, 20th century enterprise, so much of the hallmarks of companies that were celebrated in the 20th century they were designed in a centralizing way to capture as much value as possible for those who own the enterprise. Whereas 21st century enterprises, there are far more distributive designs that aim to share value far more equitably with all who co-create and use it. Here are some examples. Employee ownership, like John Lewis partnership in the UK or Huawei phones in China. But not only caring about the employees, caring also about those throughout the supply chain, paying living wages and ensuring ethical purchasing practices throughout supply chains worldwide. 
Open Design. I know this looks like a rock concert. It's actually a software developers conference for the company Drupal, which makes open source website software. And these people are holding up their fingers as if to say, I may be but one drop, but look what happens when we get together. We create a wave of innovation. Major corporations would be hugely envious of the size and the sheer passion of this research and development team when they come together once a year to co-create, to patch and repair new code. And the fair tax commitment, which is taken on by companies like Lush Cosmetics, a commitment to pay the right amount of tax in the right place at the right time. Whereas we know that many companies spend huge amounts of money ensuring that they pay the least amount of tax in as few places as possible, as rarely as possible. So where is your company on the scale from doing nothing to doing the donut with regenerative and distributive design at the top? Many executives when looking at this say, well, actually our company is in several places. You could say, for example, that the CEO speaks as if we are doing the donut. We are regenerative and distributive by design, but middle managers are actually incentivized to merely do what pays now. Or we may be aiming to do mission zero on climate change, but we're not really doing anything on human rights. So can business do business in the donut? What is it that means some companies are at the bottom of the corporate to-do list and others are aiming for the top to be distributive and regenerative by design. The answer does not lie in the design of their products. The answer lies in the design of business itself. In the 20th century, extractive enterprise was dominant and it asks one overriding question. How much financial value can we extract from this enterprise? But if you talk to the leaders, the founders, the CEOs of the most dynamic 21st century companies, they are asking a very different question. How many benefits can we generate in the way we design this enterprise? Benefits for the community, for the living world, for our customers, for our suppliers, for our owners, but all in a balance with others. So what is it that leaves some companies trapped in that extractive mentality? while others are already dancing in that generative space, because we can all think of companies on both sides of this divide. What is it that divides them? And here I draw on five key design traits set out by the brilliant corporate analyst, Marjorie Kelly. The first is purpose. What is the purpose of the company? Why does it exist? What purpose is it in service to? Is it serving maximizing its own returns or is it in service to a bigger purpose, a living purpose far greater than itself, to which it's merely contributing. The Danish oil and natural gas company, Dong, must have had some fascinating conversations about purpose around their board table some years ago, because they moved out of fossil fuels 100% into renewable energy, and as a result had to rename themselves Ørsted after the man who discovered electromagnetism. Next is networks. How is your company relating to its customers, its suppliers, its allies, its industry partners? The renewable energy company Good Energy in the UK builds tight networks with its customers, its suppliers and its industry ecosystem and lets them know about each other so that there's a strong network there which holds the company to its values when times get tough and it's under pressure. Thirdly, governance. What are the principles and practices of governments, the metrics and incentives, the culture and the norms? Of course, extractive enterprise is dominated by the idea that the quarter is king. Every quarter, financial officer must show growing sales, growing profits and growing market share to keep investors happy. In generative enterprise, governance is used to lock in far wider set of values. Some companies become B corporations, writing into their Articles of Association that they are there not only to maximise returns for shareholders, but also to deliver social and environmental value. The former CEO of Unilever, Paul Pullman, famously said on the day he became CEO of the company, he also said we will no longer issue quarterly reports. If you're in it for such short-term returns, you're in the wrong company. Triodos Bank, the CEO, told me that every Monday morning, all the staff in the headquarters come together and they spend the first 40 minutes of the day talking about their purpose because that sets the tone for the whole week. And the Swedish sportswear company Houdini has adopted the donut as its own standards of reporting on its social and environmental performance. 
So purpose, networks, and governance. These are the three easier design traits to change. Let's go deeper. Lies below is ownership. How is the company owned? Is it owned by its founding entrepreneur, a family, its employees? Is it owned by the state, by venture capital, by shareholders? Because all of these very different designs of ownership profoundly determine the fifth and final trait, which is finance, the quality of finance and what that finance is demanding. Is finance demanding fast and financial returns? Deliver me a high return or I'm out? Or is finance saying, I'm investing in you because like you, I want to see social and environmental value generated with a fair financial return? And that's a big question. What is a fair financial return? But it's a long and purposeful investment. These five design traits profoundly shape what a company can do and be in the 21st century, whether it's trapped in extractive design or it can become generative by design. So what would it take to turn all five of those traits in the direction of generative design? And think of a company that you know or love, one that you're joining or leaving, one that you run or that you're the newest employee, and ask yourself which design traits draw this enterprise back into extractive mode? Where is it stuck? And what would it take to change those? And which design traits already will enable your enterprise to become generative? And what can be done now to further take it in that direction? So imagine putting your company at the heart of the donut and asking yourself, is the way that we make money, is that helping bring humanity into the donut or is that actually driving humanity out? Where on the corporate to-do list is your company? On the scale, is it doing nothing, doing what pays now, doing your fair share, doing mission zero, or is it actually setting out to do the donut, to be regenerative and distributive by design? And the key design traits that determine whether or not your company will be able to do that are its purpose, its networks, its governance, how it's owned, and how it's financed. So that's what happens when business meets the donut. At Donut Economics Action Lab, we are developing workshops for companies to take themselves step by step through this and find entry points for making the transformations they need. Is your company born to do the donut or must it transform to do the donut? Both of those paths bring challenges and both of them are essential for the transformation that's needed in business this century if business is to help bring humanity into the donut.